Good evening and welcome. I'm Nancy Hopko, member of the board of directors of the League of Women Voters of Central Delaware County. And on behalf of the League, I thank you for joining us this evening for our annual Jeanette Ross lectureship. I'll tell you in a moment who she was. As many of, of you know, prior to the pandemic, many of our programs were luncheon programs or evening programs with speakers. And due to the pandemic, we have moved most of our programs to Zoom. And we've been just delighted by the, by the positive response to having Zoom programming. As of this morning, we had 51 people registered for tonight's program. And we know that once it's posted on our league website, uh, we will get dozens to even hundreds of hits on, on programs. So that's been extremely valuable in extending our reach very economically. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan civic organization committed to promoting political responsibility through informed and active participation in government, citizenship, and elections. Our motto is making democracy work. And we do that through registering people to vote, organizing and presenting candidate forums, providing candidate information through vote411.org and hosting educational programs on various issues of concern. Many of our programs this spring are related in some way to the theme of health. Um, let's see, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping details for this Zoom meeting. All of the participants except our speakers, the moderator, and our technological wizard, Kathleen Youngman, should be muted. The questions submitted prior to today have been shared with the speaker, and additional questions may be submitted during the presentation using the chat function. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'm going to alert you to upcoming programs. These are also found on this uh, LWVCD website. Uh, March 31st at noon, we have Navigating Challenges of Civil Discourse, Strategies to Build Bridges. On April 4 at 5.30, the PA League of Women Voters will offer a webinar on ballot box basics, the importance of school board elections. And our next health program will be April 21st at noon, featuring Dr. Monica Taylor, who is the um, chair of the county commissioners to talk on building the public health infrastructure in Delaware County one year later. We'll be celebrating in April the one year anniversary of the opening of our health department. So that is an enormous accomplishment that this chapter was key in bringing about. Now, I want to tell you who was Jeanette Ross. Uh, she was a league member and an environmentalist. She chaired the Media League of Women Voters in the late 1990s. And the league had a seat on the Delaware River Valley Authority that Jeanette filled. So we honor her with an annual lectureship targeting environmental issues. And now we'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Ruth McDermott Levy is a professor and director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, U.S. Region 3 Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. This is located at Villanova University's Fitzpatrick College of Nursing. She teaches and researches in the area of the intersection of human health and the environment. She has published on topics that include incorporating climate change into nursing curricula, climate and health impacts for older adults and children, climate change, mortality, and the health impacts of unconventional national, natural gas extraction in Pennsylvania. I will note, she didn't, but she is a co-author of a free downloadable book that has received the American Journal of Nursing Book of the Year Award a number of times. Uh, you can go into the Association of Nurses for a N, what is it? It's Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Thank you. And download this book for free on environmental health. I recommend that you just stash that in your files for future reference because it's broad reaching. Um, 
Ruth and her colleagues are examining climate change adaptation of community-based organizations in Pennsylvania. In 2018, she was a Fulbright scholar in Finland where she worked with Finnish nurses to link climate change to health and address mitigation and adaptation strategies. She was the 2020 Charlotte Brody Award recipient for the nurse who exemplified environmental health leadership in the country. And the editor, oh, this is it, the, the editor in chief of Environmental Health and Nursing Second Edition. Ruth knows that climate change is our greatest public health threat and our greatest public health opportunity. So we are delighted to have her with us to reflect on the urgent issues facing us in Delaware County. Ruth, thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. And, and thank you uh, for the invitation to talk to everyone. And, and thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Uh, um, I, I tried to answer the questions that came in as best I could uh, with the talk. And then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. Because as you know, uh, Delaware County is, of the, the suburban counties uh, surrounding Philadelphia, it is um, unique and complex. And, um, you know, I, I, it's great to hear everyone's thoughts on that. So I will advance my slide and hope it works. Oh. Okay, wait. Ah, it worked when I tried. There we go. I just want to um, explain a little bit about what the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit is because it, it is a resource uh, for, for you all. We do focus on children and uh, people who are in their reproductive uh, years, people um, considering having children. But um, you know, if there are children in your life in any way, we're happy to talk to you. Um, and, and we do often talk to um, you know, grandparents and things. So we are a national network of um, environmental experts and, and we have toxicologists, physicians, I'm a nurse, um, and other people involved, public health people involved in um, environmental health. And so we, uh, you know, if we can't help you at our center, we, we have this network of, of brilliant people that can help you work. I have great colleagues. Um, and as I said, our mission is related to improving reproductive and children's health, um, relate, again, related to environmental health. Um, and also we, we just updated in the last year our mission and it, we really included the addressing historical injustices and ongoing environmental racism that, um, and also the existential threat of climate change. So, um, you know, we, we are doing our best to help uh, the wider community. We, uh, this is the um, map, so you can see we're broken down by the Department of Health and Human Services regions. We cover region three, so it's Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Um, and so, uh, you know, we get calls and, and do work in that region and travel around to communities as well. We are funded uh, primarily from ATSDR, which is the Agency for Toxic Substance Disease Registry, Registry which is part of CDC. So um, we, again, have access to our nation's toxicologists. Um, and so, uh, because we are we are funded by these organizations, our services are free. So again, um, we help. We want to help communities. Uh, we are what we primarily do is education, such as tonight. Consultation, meaning if if you have an issue, uh, for example, I got a call um, this week from a woman concerned about uh, her daughter being exposed possibly to gasoline from where she's driving and. And so, and she shared the lab work with me. And in this case, she really needs to see a toxicologist. So I'm helping her make that, um, you know, helping with the referral. So I did the consultation and then referral. So they're, they're the things we do. We help people link. If we don't have the answers, we help people link to the people who do. Um, and again, we're funded by ATSDR. And I'm not gonna mention any commercial products, but I have to do that because that's what the government wants me to do. Um, so that that's all done. But again, I I, um, I know I'm biased because this is I work in this area. But we we really do um, are willing to help people navigate the challenges of an, of environmental issues because they can be quite complex. This, of course, is Delaware County, um, and the things that I want to just remind you about. I know you know this, but just to remind 
you, you've got two major highways um, running through the county, right? You've got the Blue Route and then I-95. And with that, you know, comes pollution. Um, and we're going to look a little more deeply at the county before we get at some of those issues. Um, I actually don't live in Delaware County. I live on the other side, oops, other side of Wayne, which is uh, Chester County side. But uh, all my, my the majority of my professional career has been working in Delaware County, either at Villanova University or I um, worked for many years as a home care nurse. And my first uh, area was Yaden, uh, Drexel Hill and Darby. And then I did kind of move down the Delaware River into Chester and Aston and, is our, and um, Marcus Hook are the areas that I worked as a visiting nurse. So I do know these communities fairly well. Um, I always like to look at data and kind of, you know, point things out. And so I did do the most recent census data, which would be 2022. And, um, you know, almost a quarter of the population is uh, under 18 years old. Um, and then, a, you know, a little less than 20% is over 65. And so they're, you know, they're kind of um, populations that can have some um, specific risk. Children, um, and this is why we have a pediatric environmental health specialty unit, children are at unique risk because their, their organs are developing. And so we don't want to have any extra environmental exposures for them because that can interfere with their entire life. And so that's, again, one of the reasons we government um, supports this type of program. Um, uh, uh, Delaware County does have um, almost a quarter of the county is black, but um, those of you who know the county know that, that the um, racial minorities or ethnic mi minorities tend to be um, in uh, the, the southern section or along the river section of the county. And then the rest of the county is um, many more white people. And that also corresponds to the economics of the county. And um, there are things that really um, influence um, possible exposures for people. And, and we're gonna get into that. And that's probably not new news for you. The other thing I wanna point out in these data is that there's almost 13% of your population has um, English, a, a, a language other than English is spoken at home. And so that's an indication of um, you know, immigrant populations. and. Uh, as a Fulbrighter, living uh, the experience of living in Finland, of not being able to read, uh, you know, I didn't even know how to call for an emergency. I couldn't read. Uh, I didn't know how to use my oven because the, the it was written. The, I had to, you know, open up the book manual of how to use it because it didn't make sense to me. And I couldn't even read that material. So when you think about emergency material or reading labels on things. Um, that's a problem, and that's 13% of your population. And so there's things to think about um, <laughs> as we think about everybody who, you know, these are your neighbors. Um, another indicator of uh, how people are doing and, and risk for populations is the median home income, household income, excuse me. And so, you know, looking up at the, the top part of the county, you've got, you know, a top, and I guess that's the Western part, um, you've got, you know, a much higher income as opposed to, you know, further down. Um, Darby is not on this list, but that um, that is a low income community, too. And um, Chester is a low income community. And so um, there are unique risks and um, exposures from issues of racism. I mean, I, I don't there's no getting around that. Let's just put that out there. Um, and then the other thing is you can see in this map, like, you know, this is more urbanized and this is a little more rural. Um, and so you have those differences too when you think about the issues for your county. And so uh, the uniqueness of Delamere County is, you know, the, 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 the glaring difference of very affluent and very poor. And um, I, it, it's, it's, it's overwhelming actually. And it's something that you know we need to think about. That again, these these are neighbors. These are the, these are people you know in both communities that you know are are working probably in the same places but in different jobs. Um, and you know during COVID, these are um, our low income communities were the, mostly the essential workers. And so again, these are people, our neighbors, and these are people that are important to us. So. 
Uh, I, I was pleased to see the, the end of the title, I think it was Environment and Sustainability and Justice. And um, so I really uh, am hoping that we can take uh, an environmental justice lens as we think of, of Delaware County and, and um, you know, it, it, in, with the faculty that I work with in the environmental sciences, when we think about Delaware County, that's typically what the conversation is about the issues of environmental justice. Um, one of the things that you'll hear people say is um, EJ communities, and that actually, I, I, I think we should start thinking about that in terms of our neighbors, not labeling just, well, it's EJ community and just dismiss it. We need to help people um, address these issues and, and help ha help them have a, a full life and um, uh, have the same opportunities everyone else does. And so for those of you who the term is new to, the, the term um, environmental justice may be new to you. Robert Ballard is known as the father of environmental justice. And what he did, and, and I, I like this definition better than, than some of the others, including the EPA, um, is that he, he took um, human and civil rights and, and coupled that with um, environmentalism. So thinking about that you know people's rights to um, being treated fairly, and and not overburdening low income um, communities and communities of color, and and we're going to get into that. And again, I'm I'm sure it's no surprise to you um, knowing the county, um, and and I've been reminded of thinking of the term nothing about us without us, and that is a, a phrase that's often used um, uh, about environmental justice and. Um, I think that's an important thing for us to think about. Again, trying to um, raise people up and give them opportunities that um, many of us have had. So one of the questions that I was asked is, uh, what is the, I think it was the, what are the top three environmental concerns of Delaware County? And I couldn't stop with three. And, and Delaware County is not unique in this um, entirely. Um, but certainly lead is still a problem. I know you had a, a program about lead, but lead, um, it, it remains a problem and we can't forget it. Um, there's other things that are going on, but we still need to keep that in mind. Um, certainly air quality is a problem in the county. Um, climate change, uh, it's real and we're not, there's no escaping it at this point. And so they'd be the top things. But the other things is uh, for many people, there's a lack of awareness of environmental risk. And, um, you know, I, I live in this space, so I just kind of walk around and think about environmental risk, but I know not everyone does, and it's important that people um, have an understanding of how to protect themselves. Um, just because something is on the market may, doesn't mean it, it is safe, um, or it, it doesn't mean you're using it correctly. And then also, our, and I don't think this is a surprise to anybody, but I, I want to just put that out there as well, our regulations don't really protect us, um, and and they don't make public health a priority, and and they need to. And so, you know, it's something that we all need to think about, especially the League of Women Voters trying to advocate for putting health in all um, priorities. So WHO recommends that putting health in all policies, um, but uh, we don't seem to pay much attention to that here in this country. So I just do want to run through a couple things about lead. Um, you know, in case somebody missed the program. And again, um, we're getting a lot of lead calls now. And I, uh, you know, anything we can do to protect mostly children, this is an issue for. So lead exposure is primarily through ingestion. So you eat something that may contain lead or inhaling something. And again, when we get into air quality in Delaware County, that's something to consider. We did recently have a case um, where the, the mom was, well, the family was um, an immigrant family and the mother was using some um, lotion uh, that, you know, was kind of a cultural thing to use, and it had lead, and from holding her children, they got it, so you can get, um, like, dermal uh, absorption as well, so they're kind of the top ones, and then the other ones are not as common, um, and so one, a couple things that may not have been mentioned in your lead program um, is that, well, I, I'm sure it was mentioned that lead exposure, it's a neurotoxin, so it attracts, affects the child's and adults brain uh, activity, let's say it that way if we're thinking about adults as well. But um, it, there is an association between um, lead exposure and criminal activity. And so thinking about you know, long-term 
um, opportunities for someone who may be exposed. And also as we age, lead gets stored in our bones. And so as we age, if we had lead exposure, it can also then come out. And so there is an, an association between dementia and Alzheimer's disease with lead. And so it's something, you know, it's not just for children. It's something that we all need to be concerned about and try to reduce the risk. So um, I think I, oh, I have two more slides on lead and then we'll get into other things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a public health nurse. I never miss the opportunity to, to you know, give people um, opportunities to protect themselves. So if if you have um, children and know of children or think you or someone is at risk of lead exposure, um, ask your provider for a, a test. And then if you don't have a provider, uh, the Delaware County um, uh, Health Department can help you with that, with their wellness line. And then um, all children with, who have, are covered by Medicaid are required to be tested at 12 and 24 months. Um, the last couple of months that has been problematic because of COVID and that's starting to get better. But um, another thing, again, for the league to think about, I'm giving you all work to do here, is in, in Washington, D.C., and just recently the state of Indiana, they require blood lead levels tested for all children. It tends They tend to um, look primarily at low-income children because of risk, but they're a risk for um, all children. And so um, it's something to think about. If we can, you know, catch it early, we can really protect um, the child and, and make sure their opportunities are available to them. Um, there was a question in the uh, chat or the, the questions that Nancy sent to me in advance about fluorinated water. And I know there had been questions in the past about um, can uh, fluorinated water um, help lead leach out of the pipes and, and ex help uh, is there a relationship between elevated blood level, lead levels and fluorinated water? So uh, there aren't many studies on this. The one that came, one um, that did say there is a relationship was a study in rats. And then um, a study, and the CDC cites this study um, with Urbanski and Schock that um, there was no interaction between fluoride and lead in water. And so, you know, this is kind of where you do the precautionary principle. And if you think there's a risk, you you, you try to reduce that risk and you know until you have all the evidence. So that's the lead and water piece. Um, and then there was along the same lines was, is fluoride a neurotoxicant? So does that affect brain development and neurological development? Um, there were some early studies uh, from uh, out of the Chan School, which is Harvard's P School of Public Health, suggesting that there, it is a neurotoxicant. And then uh, most recently, um, Gunth et al and uh, colleagues uh, looked at 23 epidemiological studies. And those, those studies are kind of like natural habitat of what's really happening. Um, and they didn't find there was an association. So again, it's, it's kind of iffy, but it looks like you know more recently and, and looking at all those studies that would indicate that, but this is something that needs to be kept an eye on. Um, I, you know, so that's that's my answer to that question. Um, and I hate that answer of more research, but I, I think that might be the way to go. Um, uh, and, and you're going to have to do epi studies with that. So that leads us to air quality. And I'm going to quick have a drink here. So the sources of air, air pollution, the major sources within the county are, of course, the vehicles. So I mentioned I-95 and the Blue Route. Um, Marcus Hook Industrial Complex uh, from the natural gas, the pipeline that's coming through. And then, of course, uh, the incineration plant in Chester. Additionally, I mean, uh, the county, you're very close to uh, Philadelphia Airport. And so you've got, you know, the jets flying over and then the Port of Delaware. So they're, they're you know, you're talking about in the lower part of the county, a very industrialized area. And um, the air air pollution, you know, if, of all the pollutants, I think it's the worst because first of all, we all breathe, right? We're all breathing all the time. So we're, it affects everyone. And it also, you know, goes up in the atmosphere and then comes down in rain. So you've got it in water and soil as well. So um, air pollution is, is quite problematic. Um, and it doesn't just stay where it's, where it, it is originated from. Certainly where it, it is originated from, it tends to be a little more um, 
uh, uh, I, I'm the, it, it, you're, it, it's more concentrated where, you, you know, where at the source of where it's originated from, but it can travel as far as uh, 1200 miles. So usually about 12 ish miles. So, you know, if you live up in Wayne, you're getting the same pollution from people down in the county, depending on the direction of the wind blows. So um, that's something else to keep in mind. And we've seen that, you know, internationally with wildfires from Russia that go into Finland or or um, when we've gotten pollution from things that are happening in China on the West Coast. So it really does travel far. And um, so again, thinking about what is our responsibility in the county for those that are most impacted, but what is the responsibility for the larger community as well? Um, I'm sure you've seen the uh, uh, air quality index uh, from the EPA. And they, they did a really nice job of kind of standardizing it. And it's from increments of 50. So it's very easy to remember. And it really just compiles uh, these uh, 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 index pollutants of fine particles, ground level ozone, sulfur, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and carbon monoxide. And, and you know, creates a calculation of where we are um, for our air quality. Ideally, if we're always green, that's great. Um, we have really good air quality. Most of the time, um, our, um, most communities will dip down into yellow. Not all the time, but um, often. And then, and yellow is can be a problem for people who are um, sensitive. But as we move down, it starts to be a problem for um, you know everyone. The air quality and certain of Certain um, of these pollutants can be a problem for anybody, and I'm going to get into um, those in a little more detail. I made this graph this for my students many years ago, just because it was I just thought it was so confusing of where the criteria pollutants are coming from and what does that all mean. And so up at the top has the pollutants, and then um, in green, I, I mean, excuse me, in blue, I highlighted the the specific areas that we see for the county. Um, and so um, industry, industry and automobiles, and you kind of see that uh, go all the way through as of in, uh, industry and certainly um, anything with combustion. So using cars or oil and gas installations, all of those things um, are cause some sort of air pollution. The, the next uh, row is the acute, so uh, you know, a little bit of exposure. Um, or uh, can cause, you know, things like burning in your nose, eye irritation, and those things. And then what are the long-term uh, risks and health impacts? And so we get things like asthma, we can get heart attacks, um, a respiratory disease, all of those things. Um, and you can see it's quite problematic. And actually, one thing that is not there, but I'm going to get into it a little bit later, is um, the, the impact on the developing fetus and low birth weight and all those things. So it affects uh, the human throughout the life cycle. And um, again, we all breathe air and we breathe it all the time and we need it to live. So um, it is it is a really important pollutant. The American Lung Association, I don't know if you've ever looked at this, is the state of the air report and it breaks it down by counties. And um, and so Delaware County has an overall grade of a D. Um, and I don't know about you, but I don't think anybody likes a D. And um, and for and it's also for um, both ozone and particulate pollution. Um, and so that again is a problem. Delaware the um, American Lung Association is a really nice resource for air air um, things. And they have another report that I'm going to quote. Um, I actually was just at a conference uh, earlier this week, and uh, they're coming out with the new report sometime in April. I want to say April 12th, but sometime they're coming out with the, the next um, edition of this. So, um, and they every year they put out the state of the air. In Delaware County, there are uh, a, a little over 14,000 children already that have asthma. And so if they are breathing poor air quality, um, you know, grades of D or, or um, you know, constant or even an acute episode of poor air quality, that's going to make them have, you know, exacerbation of asthma and an asthma attack, maybe end up in the emergency room where mom or dad have may have to miss pay or a day of work um, and the child can miss school. So 
you know, and then you, if they miss too much, you know what, what that all leads to. So it is a problem. Within the county, the air monitors are in Chester and Marcus Hook, so they are in, in uh, more industrialized areas. Um, but uh, again, the wind is blowing all over and it, um, there are things to think about. This is ozone. This is uh, the expressway. You can see that grayish look. Um, and and that ozone, ground level ozone is a, a, um, a very potent irritant to the lungs. So even people without lung disease can feel the effects of this and it really can irritate the lungs. And I just know my days of doing home care on really hot, hazy days like that, I would come home completely wiped out. Um, and so again, thinking about people who um, are low income, may not have air conditioning, and exposed to that or live in areas where the pollution is uh, worse. Um, you know, it, it, it again interferes with people's opportunity and thinking about issues of justice. Now, I'm not saying that we should then move pollution to other parts of the county. I'm saying we need to be responsible and try to, to make uh, it less polluted. Um, so when we breathe in, there's things to think about, and this may, uh, some of you may know this, or it may be a review of um, your high school uh, uh, science classes, but, it, you know, think about if it comes through your nose, your airway is there, and you have, like, little hairs, like, that are called cilia, that, and they, they would clean out the larger particles, so there's, uh, there's three types of particles for a particulate matter. We've got um, 10, um, at 10, 2.5, and then ultrafine. Um, we don't yet measure ultrafine, but the, essentially the smaller the particle, the easier it is to get down into the lungs. So the 2.5 and the ultrafine can get down into the lungs and in your lungs are these little air sacs. And what surrounds the air sac are um, uh, capillaries, little blood vessels. Those particles, the smaller particles, are small enough to get through those capillaries into your body. So in other words, breathing is a direct association into your body. So you might as well just drink it. I mean, it's the same as ingesting it because you're breathing it in and it goes right into your bloodstream, those tiny, small particles. And, um, and so again, this is why um, this is very problematic when we think about air pollution for um, for anybody, but for communities where the pollution is being generated, it's really problematic. This is a picture of uh, the the um, this this is actually supposed to be an image of your hair. These are grains of sand. These are the um, the blue is the 10. So they're the bigger ones that get caught in your nose and your upper airway. The little tiny ones that are 10 microns, I mean, excuse me, 2.5 microns, the little tiny ones, that's how small they are against a strand of hair. So we're talking about tiny, tiny little pieces, which often you cannot see. So um, again, um, more than likely you're breathing in some of those now. Hopefully they're not too contaminated, but your, you know, your body is uh, able to handle some of it, but if it's constant and chronic, it can be a big problem, even at low levels. So I, I said that we had um, air monitoring at uh, Marcus Hook and Chester for the county, and also uh, Philadelphia measures it. They all kind of play off of each other and come up with the air quality index, but a lot of the thing with those is, is they're not getting the exact time. Um, you know, they they uh, measure it and report it at different times, and so sometimes people want um, real time measurement, and or they, especially in rural areas, because I did do some work with fracking communities, they don't even have um, air quality monitoring, and so um, a way to get around that is this this um, company known as Purple Air. And they, it's a uh, outdoor air monitor that um, people can use and it's, you need to use, you need to have internet. So that's one thing, people need internet for this. But it's a way actually for com community members to measure air quality. You can see all these other colored dots up there um, and then they report it back. And so it's a way also to share what is happening in the community. So it's, it's, a, it's a 
piece of citizen science where um, community members are gathering the data and sharing it back. Um, and this actually, I did this last night, I believe. And um, no, I, on the 21st. So I did it the other night on uh, Monday night. Yeah, no, Tuesday night, right? Today's Thursday. So, but I found Gr Glenn Riddle. And at that time, at 8.30 at night, it was nine. So their air quality was really good. Um, down here in, it looks like it's Maryland. It was 110, which is very problematic. And I just was wondering what the heck they were doing. Um, but you know, I don't know what was going on there, but you can see again, if, if people are really interested and a, again, a way to gather data, data is really important to try to make changes for, um, you know, for policy or for polluters. And this is one way to do it. But again, it costs $300 about, and, um, you know, think about low income, income communities that can be a problem. So it's a way to think about how we might help them though. Um, if if you don't want to go that route, you can use um, Air Now, and if you have access to the internet, I have it on my phone because I am an air quality geek. I can't help myself, so you can um, put the app in. I just um, googled it on my phone, put in Air Net, Air Now, and then um, you know downloaded it, and I can just check air quality. It's not necessarily real time, but it does. And it, you know, the, the monitor is not exactly where I am, but it gives me an overall picture. Um, and so this was, uh, again, at the same time um, on uh, Tuesday night. And uh, the forecast was uh, yellow. So that is not, you know, again, that's a problem for sensitive groups. Um, and, and, but for all of us, if we're breathing yellow, not that the air is yellow, but what in the yellow range, if we're breathing that for a while, you know, many days, it can add up and cause problems for us. So um, again, things to think about. The, the per air, air now measures, gives you the reading for PM 2.5, that smaller um, particles, and then ground level ozone. It doesn't give you any of the other readings. And purple air only gives you um, PM 2.5. So it only gives you particulates. But it is, particulates do kind of give you a, an indication of, okay, that whether there's a problem or not. Um, there is, and this is something to think about, those of you who, um, who have, work for different community organizations, such as schools or the faith community or your library, we do have, um, the EPA has this flag program that um, the flags match the color of the um, air quality index. And so, you know, you'd look and find out what it is that morning and then raise the flag to what the, the pred predictions are for the day. If anyone's interested, um, uh, you can put in the chat and, and your contact information and I can get those flags for you. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to like let people know whether their quality is healthy or not especially for people who have asthma, that's why schools use it so that um, you know the caregivers then can make sure the child has their inhaler and all those things. But I also, I, I see also as an opportunity to let the community know what their air quality is. And if it's consistently a problem, it's also a way to engage people of, you know, we've got a problem and then they start asking questions. Um, and, you know, because this is a lot of work just to do on your own so you can get more people engaged. That can be quite helpful. So again, um, I can get those for you without any problem. This uh, is from uh, the American Lung Association. They just recently put out a document about um, uh, trucks and buses and um, how they interfere with the air quality, especially diesel. Um, for the particulates and the other um, toxicants that they release. And so they these big yellowish or light greenish circles are the areas across the country, I believe it's 16 areas, that are mostly most densely use of heavy trucks. And of course, Delaware County is right there, you know, at, on, under one of the dots. And so, um, you know, we also need to think about that of how to improve air quality for transportation, um, because that's not going away either. Um, the, the good news is that um, the uh, IRA, the, um, uh, the 
what is it, the Rescue Act, the, the recent act um, from the Biden administration uh, has money from the EPA for heavy duty vehicles. Um, and so, uh, and, and it's in the billions of dollars. And so, uh, you know, thinking about trying to get that for communities um, and included in that is school buses. And they are really targeting um, low income communities of color for school buses. Um, and so that's something to think about to help uh, uh, communities. It, it's not gonna solve every problem, but it will help reduce emissions. And there have been studies about school bus emissions um, also kind of uh, permeating onto the bus. And so kids with respiratory problems, that, that can be quite problematic. So if we can get um, electric buses and it includes in that bill, the infrastructure to charge the buses. So, um, and, and you can also then encourage uh, different industries to think about um, electric heavy duty vehicles. So that is one way to reduce uh, the local air pollution and reduce the greenhouse gases, which is really good. So, um, you know, that is out there. So then our other uh, major polluter is the Delaware Valley Resource Recovery Facility um, is among uh, one of the problematic polluters. Um, so the thing to think about uh, with this is oh, uh, that um, when you burn anything, um, you're going to have emissions, okay? And, and the EPA allows for a certain amount of emissions. They have, you know, the regulations and they, what they determine is safe. But the thing is, they're pollutants and they're toxicants. So I think all of us would agree that you don't want that floating around in your neighborhood. So most incineration um, yields things like mercury and lead, which are neurotoxins. So we talked a little bit about, about lead and the problems they can cause. Mercury can cause um, some similar-ish problems. Um, dioxin is a known carcinogen. Um, and you may have heard about that recently with the train derailment and when they burned the, um, the vinyl chloride. And we talked about particulates and then uh, nitrous oxide is also a, a problem. Now, and, and a, a greenhouse gas. DEP um, actually has just reduced the permissible levels of, of dioxin. But again, these are all pollutants. And so even if we're at permissible levels, they're releasing um, pollutants. There are, um, there have been violations of um, these emissions. I did go to the um, DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection for Pennsylvania, um, and I couldn't find any recent violations. I know there's people on this call that may be aware of them. And so, you know, if you wanna put those in the chat box, that would be great. Um, but I could not find any recent ones. But what is happening is since the, the incineration plant was first put in, what we're burning has changed. And so, uh, and this is a, a nice uh, graphic from EPA, and it, it only goes to 2015, but it's not too terribly different, is we've gone from paper to things that can be much more problematic, such as plastic. Plastic is made from fossil fuels, okay? So, uh, you know, we're using all those this very similar chemicals that are being burnt. And then again, they're being released and it may be within cell, what, what somebody has de determined to be safe range, but it, it's not really anything you want floating around your neighborhood. So um, that is among the problems with um, such a, a place like that, very close to where people live. Um, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about alternatives and, and things. But there is um, a way to report violations um, and that is at the, uh, it's called ECHO, it's through the EPA. And so um, I, this is a screenshot, I can't scroll down, but um, if, there's, if it's an emergency, um, like something awful, like um, what happened with the der derailment, that would be a 911 call, but otherwise, um, people can report violations. Uh, I, you know, as far as their response, 
that could be a whole different story, but you are able to report it. So this brings us to um, looking at some of the data. Uh, I have three slides about uh, infants and um, air quality exposure. And as I said, um, with both, well, when we get into climate change and heat, we have problems with um, uh, uh, pregnancy and, and things. But with, um, as you look at these data, just remember there are other things that can cause low birth weight. So this is not saying absolutely uh, poor air quality is causing birth, low birth weight and, and um, other things that we're going to look at. But if we look at, um, so, uh, you know, the one column we've got uh, Pennsylvania, we've got Chester and we've got Norristown. And I picked Norristown because it's in Montgomery County and it has some similar demographics. The only thing it doesn't have is it doesn't have an incinerator and some of the other um, industrial things. So if we look at that, Chester consistently has a higher percentage of um, infants born with low birth weight. And, you know, we look at um, the most challenged group, we see that our Black neighbors are, are the most challenged with children with low birth weight. Low birth weight can be problematic because the child may not have um, fully developed and it may slow their ability um, later on, like future educational attainment, many things like that can be problematic for a child that is not um, fully uh, developed at the time of birth. The same with preterm infants. Um, again, being born too soon, we see, and, and again, low um, air pollution can be responsible. There is a relationship between air pollution, low birth weight, preterm birth, and infant mortality. And that's the next slide we're gonna look at. But you can again see that um, Chester is doing worse than it's, it's you know, the state and Norristown. Um, and again, our black neighbors are, are, you know, doing even worse. And um, the data wasn't available. Um, the, this is the only data that was available. This data is through the Department of Health, Pennsylvania Department of Health. And so again, um, we see Chester um, as far as infant mortality. So we're losing children as well. Um, and it is, uh, air pollution is one of the factors that can be um, responsible for that. So that brings us to climate change. Um, and when you think about climate change, uh, it's best just, uh, you know, thinking about it regionally. So looking at a county level is a good way to do it. Um, and in, in Delaware County, it tends to be extreme heat and weather are the big issues, primarily uh, precipitation. Uh, in 2021, I don't know if you're familiar with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but these are our, our world's climate scientists come together and look at all the you know, recent science, and then they come to an agreement, which is pretty amazing. If you've ever sat in a faculty meeting, it's amazing that they these guys could come to an agreement, but they um, they come to an agreement on what you know what are they going to share um, with the latest science. And in 2021, they said it was unequivocal that fossil fuels are driving climate change. So you know that to me is is enough. <laughs> and we knew it we knew it before, but for the IPCC to say it, that's a big deal. But actually, just this week. While I was at a climate meeting in, in uh, DC, they announced that uh, uh, essentially we're not kidding. That we need to we need to do something different. Um, and uh, if we don't change right away, um, we're going to have a really tough time limiting uh, global temperature rise to below one one point five degrees centigrade. And so. Um, they're calling on deep, rapid, and sustained reductions in greenhouse gases, and we need to do it now. Um, and so we all know our policymakers have been very sluggish on this, and so we need to do the best we can to push on our end um, to get our policymakers on board um, so those children have um, the same opportunities that we have. So um, I, I don't know if you've seen this slide before. This is... Um, from the CDC, it's been around for several years, but it shows that um, 
the environmental things that are happening with sea level rise and poor air quality and rising temperature and changes in the weather lead to you know air pollution vectors and meaning you know more mosquitoes and ticks allergens extreme weather and then that leads to the health problems that we see and we are um, you know we're seeing more uh, Lyme's disease and and actually some uh, tropical diseases in the U.S. now. Um, and so uh, more uh, asthma, more allergies, a, a lot of things. So um, this is real and it's happening. And again, thinking about uh, what's happening within the county, there's there's things we need to address. This, I think this is kind of powerful. This is starts in 1850 and it's showing uh, a global temperature rise. It only goes to, I think, 2015. Um, but in 1850 is like the beginning of industrialization, but oh, 2016. But uh, you know, eight you were eight years later, and and uh, you know, thinking about where we are, but we're 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 dancing very close to a 1.5 degrees centigrade. So, what does this mean for? the people of the county. Um, there are groups that are much more vulnerable um, and it tends to be the same groups that are um, vulnerable to many, many things. Certainly, as I said, uh, pregnant people um, are really sensitive to the heat and it, it can actually be um, a cause for uh, preterm birth. Uh, children, because they're de just developing and children and older adults have uh, issues with thermoregulation. Children, because it's just developing, older adults, because it's getting tired. And so they're much more sensitive to heat, both those groups. And then those with uh, disabilities, whether it be cognitive, mental, or physical, um, aren't able to be removed from the situation. And so they need help. As I said, our um, immigrants, uh, neighbors, um, we need to think about them too, because they may not know the warning signs in this area or understand the, the language. And our outdoor workers and athletes. and then. Then, of course, low-income neighbors, because um, they may not have air conditioning, or if they do, they may not be able to afford it to turn it on or have it on for periods of time. And so um, these are uh, important factors. Um, heat is the greatest cause of mortality related to climate change. Um, and so, we, you know, we can lose people because of this. And it tends to be um, the first heat wave of the season tends to be the most problematic. Um, Ordinarily, uh, in in like cities, we talk about this, but there is enough development within um, your county to think about um, what's known as the urban heat effect or urban heat island effect. And this is from the built environment. So we have a lot of building and, and roads that all absorbs the heat and and it does not cool down completely at nighttime. If someone does not have air conditioning, they're actually, their body um, may not cool down at nighttime as well. And so it actually wears the body out from not having, you know, from that constant exposure to heat. Um, they, you know, it, it, they're more than susceptible to heat related illness. And so, um, you know, again, thinking about the more developed areas of the county, that's um, groups that we need to consider. We have a program in the United States called LIHE for people that um, are uh, aren't uh, that aren't able to afford heat, and so that they have um, supplemental programs to help people with heat. But I really think we need to start talking about programs for air conditioning for people. Um, New York City has done something to to support the people in the city, but it's something to have um, a national discussion about. How can we? help people um, during the heat. You know, you can say you can send people to cooling centers, but you can't send people for a week at a time. I don't think that's reasonable. And if you're talking about older people, um, you know, it can be a problem of you know, adding to some, perhaps some confusion or fall risk. Um, I, I think we need to really think about that as, as a nation. Um, the other things that there's, so much research coming out um, related to climate change, and I'm grateful for the research, but it's also um, frightening. Um, but there's a, a relationship with every increase in temperature Fahrenheit, there's a decrease, a 1% decrease of learning 
for children, they found. An economist did that. I love the economic studies they come up with. But, but that can be quite significant, right? So if we've got a day that's maybe five to 10 degrees hotter, we're talking about five to, to, to 10% less learning. And this is particularly a problem for children that are, might be in low income schools that don't have air conditioning, because that's going to make it, you know, really um, exacerbate the problem. And so, and, and, the, and those kids are the kids that need to be in school the most and need to, you know, so, um, you know, thinking about justice, how can we address that and, and make sure that they, those kids have the same opportunity. And uh, I was at a climate conference um, in Oman this January, um, and I sat next to a veterinarian, um, and he was sharing with me that uh, they're concerned about prolonged heat because animals' immune systems are are weakened, and then and he was talking about livestock. Then they don't respond to vaccine. And so we can end up with a problem with zoonotic diseases, diseases that are transmitted by animals. And so uh, this is a study, this one um, has to do with cows um, that um, from prolonged heat exposure, their immune system is not intact, as intact. So again, they can be the, the vector that transmits um, infectious disease. And so uh, we gotta turn this around. We gotta, we really have a lot of work to do. Um, as far as kind of what things, what the everyday person in the county needs to think about. Um, definitely working with existing community organizations, um, you know, including them in any plans, um, educating the public about heat impact and looking out for one another, like let people know, like people, outdoor workers, we need to make sure that, you know, they may need to work in the evening um, and or have cooling places for them and lots of water. Um, opening up public cooling spaces, um, like libraries, schools, or places of worship. I'm working with the community now, and one of their problems is on hot days, everybody goes to the emergency department. And so, you know, then it, that's kind of a good idea, except then they can't treat the people that really need the care. And so, you know, we need to have places that people can go to to cool off. But again, ideally, if we can have efficient, you know, that we have very energy efficient air conditioners, so we, we can think about that. Um, and then options if there's no power to make sure that people, especially people who are relying on um, devices. And if we can maintain our trees and plant more, there are places in, in you know, as I drive around in Delaware County that I'm like, you should put some trees there. Um, it, it, it helps um, uh, absorb some of the greenhouse gases that provides cooling and nature um, is healing actually. Spending time in nature is really healing. And I talked about the funding for air conditioners. Um, far extreme, extreme weather events, it tends to be pri primarily flooding. And so we have problems with mold and, and toxins, toxins from uh, the floodwaters that would come in that would be polluted. Um, we have had, we ha now have tornadoes in the area. We had that derecho a couple of years ago. Um, big snow events can be related to climate change. Like uh, people are like, what? But it really, what happens is we can get a weakening jet stream. And so that can then bring down Arctic air and, and get a lot of snow. That um, big snow event in Boston several years ago is a really good example of that. And some of the things we've seen out West recently. Um, again, power sources, um, and again, the same groups of people that are vulnerable and, and thinking about our neighbors and what they need. Um, and then just as a reminder, uh, you know, know your local risk Bef before an emergency event, um, really, you know, have a plan of what you're going to do and share that with your friends. Take pictures if you're in a flood prone area or an area that looks like it might be at risk for wildfires because um, New England is starting to plan for wildfires now. Um, I'm sorry to say, but um, take pictures in your house of your belongings and then, you know, store it in the cloud or store it wherever you can. Um, that's been very helpful to people out um, in the West Coast with the wildfires. Have a list of your medications and all your providers. So just kind of, you know, have that plan ready because, um, you know, often we don't know when these things are going to happen. Um, follow the directions of the emergency response. Um, this is not the time to invent your own ideas. Um, and then, you know, stay out of the floodwaters and, and also be aware during the event, 
answer the mental health needs of the people um, because that's a big issue that we um, aren't doing such a great job with. Uh, so that brings us to uh, kind of worked my way down the county, the um, Marcus Hook. And so Marcus Hook, as you know, is was converted from uh, an oil refinery to now managing our, our natural gas in the state. Um, and so the Mariner East pipeline has come through uh, the county. Uh, the thing with natural gas is all along the entire route, there's risk for leak leaking. And um, in Penn, uh, through Mariner East, it's going into Marcus Hook. Um, it's natural gas liquid, so it's components of the gas. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details of, or the toxicology of all these chemicals, but let me just say they light on fire. <laughs> so it's not something you want to have in the air or in, you know, in your water. And so, um, and the biggest risk with leaks is, is air quality. And, and um, it can cause, um, you know, kind of dizziness as a group, dizziness and, and things, but if it gets high enough, it can cause, it can lead to death. Um, and so um, it, it's something, again, to be aware of. The air quality uh, monitors that I told you about do not test for this. So if it's something that people are interested in, they would have to reach out to some of the universities. I have a colleague that has an air quality lab at Villanova. Um, and, and I'm not sure if he tests for this, but that's something that, that, um, would need to be, you know, special testing, but just know that, you, uh, it's better not to live close to these things. And we've got a pipeline going right through, um, residential areas. Um, and it's the pipeline itself, as long as it's not disturbed, it's okay. But the other, the other part of the infrastructure and it's moving things along the pipeline. And so along the pipelines are metering stations and you may see, have seen these. Um, when I'm out on my bike, I see them. There's one in, um, there's a whole bunch of them out towards uh, Downingtown as I ride out there. But, um, but there, you know, again, it, this is to monitor the flow and pressure along the pipeline, but there can be uh, leaks, or they can actually have to release um, some um, some air from that, or gases from that. So that can be a problem, and and you know you get things like worsening asthma, headaches, fatigue, all of those things. Again, um, uh, through research, has shown there's a relationship between proximity to some of this infrastructure and low birth weight babies, um, and a variety of things. So um, this is. I, I, it kind of takes my breath away to be honest with you. I, I started, uh, I was the, what was I, the, the chair of the Pennsylvania State Nurses Association Environmental Committee in about 2008 when fracking just started and we were dealing with what was happening in Pittsburgh and, and in Northeast PA. And um, I, I never envisioned that it would just come rolling through my county, but here we are because um, Chester County has it as well. Um, the greatest resource for this related to public health is the Environmental Health Project. It's in Southwest Pennsylvania. Um, these are, I was on their board for several years. These are amazing, amazing people. They use, um, they either do the research or they use, um, you know, the latest research and um, great resources there. So if, if you want uh, more information, I would definitely recommend reaching out to them. Uh, as you know, the Marple Reliability Station um, is out there. That that name just kind of makes me laugh because um, it seems I've never seen the a, a compressor station called a reliability station. But what this is is it, it's to push the gas through. Um, and as you know, Marple Newtown is our Marple area where they're going to put it. It is in a fairly you know residential area, um, and so again, there's concern about that. Uh, there's a study from uh, Martin and colleagues that uh, if residents that are less than 1.2 miles away um, have had benzene um, in their homes, um, benzene is a known carcinogen. Um, and so, uh, and it, it, it's been two to 17 times the safe limits. Um, and so uh, these, this is really problematic. And they also have um, VOCs and um, indoor and outdoor, um, both indoor and outdoors. Um, and so 
you know, this is something we need to worry about. And again, remembering fossil fuels are the major cause of climate change. And so this all kind of comes together of problems, uh, lo you know, locally, but then uh, the overall global impact. What uh, they do in Europe, and they're starting to do a little bit here, is known as environmental impact assessment. And this is something that you may uh, want to try to get on the, <laughs> the docket for uh, the marble installation. Um, is, uh, and I'm not sure if it's too late, but this is often done before, or it is done before the project is, a start, is started. So. Um, that's why I'm like, I'm not sure if you're, you we're too late with this one or not. But what it does is it looks at an environmental assessment. Of what are the consequences of this project to the environment? And, and you know, you know, what are the policies? What, what is actually happening? And, and um, so they started doing some of this out um, in Colorado has used this. Um, but uh, it's, it's typically not the way we do things in the United States. We throw stuff up there and go, okay, now what do we do? But this is really what, what the way you want things done of what, what are all the problems that could happen now? How can we minimize those problems? Um, or maybe this is not the plan we want. Um, and so that, okay, as I said, they, this is what they do in Europe. Um, so uh, as a reminder and kind of overall recommendations, and then hopefully we have time to chat and um, you know, hear from the experts uh, that have been listening in. Um, uh, we really need to engage with all of our community members and and put those who are most impacted first, and 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 make sure that they have a voice. Um, it, it's just not fair. I don't know what else to say. When you think about justice, it's just not right. Um, and then uh, also, you should be you should know who your policymakers are, and you know you can you know, Google that and find out, you know, who's in Harrisburg representing you and who's representing you in DC um, and, and build a relationship with them. And, you know, so that they know that when you call, you know, you, they know you and know, you know, what to expect and you, you can start learning from each other and learning what bills are coming up. Um, also the EPA um, is a great place to find out what rules are coming up. Um, it has always boggled my mind, and I'm part of the, this problem, um, is that our our, our county colleges um, and universities and trade schools haven't really gathered around. And I'm talking about the ones just in Delaware County, um, and there are many, um, to really support the county. Um, and, and especially, you know, town, towns like Chester and Marcus Hook. Um, if nothing else, to provide technical technical assistance for grant writing, let them know about opportunities. Um, and so, you know, I'm calling out uh, my own university and and the other universities um, to really, you know, do the right thing for the community. Um, if we can maintain as much and increase the green space and look for opportunities to do that, um, make sure that there is community representation in all policies as well as public health is considered in all policies. And um, we need to break down our silos and, and really come together with both, you know, our official, official organizations, the advocacy organizations, labor groups, community organizations, academia, um, and work for a common goal. Um, you know, if, if nothing else, climate change, but maybe even healthy, you know, tomorrows for our, our community. And then also include the youth. Um, they know what's going on. Many uh, are, of our youth are anxious about climate change. And what the research shows is when you include them, it actually helps our anxiety. Um, and so, you know, we don't need to shelter them. They're, they're ready and want to, they'd like to know that we're doing something about it. Um, here's some, uh, one of the questions was where to get data. So I have a couple places for you. Um, the Department of Health, I think, is doing a much better job of making things available. So they have this Eddy site that um, is pretty user friendly. So that's one good site. If you've ever used EJ Screen, that's a really neat um, thing through the EPA, and it gives you maps and it kind of can overlap of like air pollution and low income communities, and you know see what's happening there. It's a little kind of uh, wonky to start to use it, but once. They've got videos on how to use it. And once you can, you can make these really cool maps. 
Um, and then another favorite of mine is Kath County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. And this has um, data down to um, sometimes the community level, which uh, is really helpful. Like because you're, the county is so diverse economically and racially, sometimes it's good just to look at uh, one uh, particular municipality of what's going on. Um, and so they have some of that. And, and they also have with the roadmaps piece, programs that work. And so you can get some good examples of what might work for you. Um, and so that's kind of one of my favorites. Um, and again, uh, we are available to, to um, provide you know, resources as, as much as we can or help link you to resources. And so I will stop sharing and hope we can have um, a conversation. Ruth, thank you. That was... A tremendous overview. We asked, I think we almost asked the impossible of you, but that was wonderful. And as we've been listening to Ruth, if you don't have your chat box open, Mike Ewell and Anne and Kathy have been shoving resources in there, links to resources. So uh, when this is available on the uh, website, you've got it at your fingertips. It's great. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one... One, a couple, I'm going to go to a couple questions that were submitted in advance, but I'm sure that there's a lot of comment that people want to make live too. But um, a couple of the questions had to do with organizing in uh, low-income communities. How can we facilitate low organizing by labor unions and by community, our, our neighbors in poor lower-income communities to fight this stuff? Um, I, I uh, with, let me just say the labor and then I'm gonna open it up because I know some people are here that know better about that, specifically about Chester than I do. And, and I think it's important that they say those things, but um, it, it, labor um, is, is a good group to work with. Um, and, and often when you do, uh, get down to talking about the issues, they get it. And, they, and as long as they understand that you also are concerned about their health, you can go really far. Um, because one of the concerns often can be, well, you're trying to take jobs away. And that's not it at all. As a matter of fact, renewable jobs um, actually are, um, there's more of those now than there are in the fossil fuel industry. So there's a lot and better paying and safer. So there's a lot of opportunity there. So um, I have found, um, because I did, as I said, I did research in fracking communities. And so some people weren't typically uh, thrilled with me. I'll get to the, I, I don't know the things that are those union jobs. So I, I honestly don't know. And that's a good question. But um, when I, I was doing um, work in fracking communities, I happened to, um, talk to some people that actually particularly a mother who whose son worked on oil rigs and things and she wasn't really fond of me when she found out what I was doing but the more we talked and it, she was a nurse too it was in, an interesting conversation the more we talked um, she realized that I was concerned about the workers too so uh, you know I think we are concerned every you know everybody's our neighbor we're concerned about everybody and so um, that's one way to to think about that and I don't know if somebody can answer if the renewable jobs are union, because I honestly, that I don't know. And that's a great question. Okay. Um, I don't see any, a new question popping up in the chat. So I will. Well, can go. anybody from uh, like Chester or the, imp like, you know, the heavily impacted communities want to comment on um, organizing and, and support for the community? Hi, <clears throat> my name is Kieran Warren, and I am a Chester resident. And um, I belong to uh, SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania, which is one of the largest um, labor unions. And and I also work for One Pennsylvania, which is like the community union. So if organizations want to get on the radar of unions, I would suggest that they reach out um, to a representative to find out what their current platform is and then um, try to connect that way. 
um, and then also participate in some of the, um, I guess, campaigns that they have going on for, and I can speak for myself working for One Pennsylvania, we are like a union, but we're kind of, we're the community's union because we, we fight for the rights of um, all working Americans in Pennsylvania. And so our focus is environmental justice, housing, economic justice, um, and uh, workers' rights. And so um, we go out and organize communities, we organize um, residents around those issues. Our major campaign right now that I am actually leading is the whole home repairs campaign, which includes weatherization um, mm -hmm. and environmental justice. And uh, so we had our first political action meeting last week um, about that, and we're having another one um, on April 6th. So uh, unions and organizations like those um, are organizing around issues, but if certain organizations want to be included, I would suggest that they reach out to them. Thank you. Thanks. That's helpful. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm going to go on to a, one of the questions submitted for us. Um, let's see. We had a question about what comprehensive environmental review entails. Is that something that you can comment on? You know, I, 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 I got the sense, and I don't know, you know, if somebody asked that question, please speak up. I got the sense that that was from the newspaper. And and I I googled that com the comprehensive environmental review and it's not really anything so I I'm wondering and again whoever if somebody um, has more information I'm wondering if that was the journalist kind of um, condensing it okay. um, and that's why I put that environmental impact because that's really what you want. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Julie Hi. Baker mm -hmm. who submitted that question. Oh, good. And that language actually comes from the Commonwealth Court. Okay. They overturned, they vacated the Public Utility Commission's rubber stamping of PICO's plan for the Marple reliability, quote unquote, station. Right. And the language they used and it was a unanimous decision of all nine judges to, um, to vacate the decision and to remand the case back to the PUC and saying that they failed and have the obligation to conduct what they called a comprehensive environmental review. Hmm. So the Marple Township solicitor then submitted an application that that court's opinion be published because I think their rules have just changed a little bit and there are differences between opinions that are, are rendered and then those that are actually published. Hmm. So that's where it stands. Okay. Yeah, um, and that's, that's great that it, they, they've, you know, kind of pushed back, but the, um, like in the, there's either an environmental risk assessment that is often done kind of after the fact or a, an environmental impact assessment. I, I'm, again, making the assumption that the judge is just saying, go study it, but is not identifying exactly how it to be studied. So, yeah, and that's great that, that our, the Commonwealth is finally doing that. Okay. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Um, Ruth, how do you think health professionals can build trust with our minority neighbors and poor communities when we have so traumatized them for the entire history of the you know development of the country? Um, wow. Uh, we, I, I think, first of all, we need to listen. Um, and and uh, make sure we really understand what the needs are. Um, I think that's really important. And we also need to to um, 
when we say we're going to do something, we need to do something. So we we need, you know, we need to build trust. And and that I think in some communities that's going to take some time because um, you know, we failed the community. Um, but I, I think that's I think those are the most important. I also think I know my own um, professional organization, the Alliance of Nurses. Yeah, listen and follow. Thank you, Kathy. I, um, follow through. I, I also think um, my own professional organization, we're really working to um, engage our um, uh, you know, brother and sister nurses uh, that are from underrepresented groups. And, and again, it's, it, it is not happening so easily. And so again, uh, we need to really listen and make sure we're, we're, we're meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could I add to that, um, Joyce Raisin, and I happen to be a retired health professional, I'm a retired professor of nursing, uh, and I just have to underline what was just said. Uh, number one, in going, to, going into any community would be establishing trust, and we know that you can't establish trust sometimes in, in, a, few, in a few minutes or even an hour. It takes time to establish trust, and establishing trust is, again, I think what was said is doing what you said you're going to do. Uh, and I think, and number one in, in establishing trust is listening to people. What do they need? Um, traditionally, historically, in public health, way back, we used to go into different places in our country and outside of this country and telling people what we thought was best for them. We realized that doesn't work. Um, we have to start where the community is and finding out and listening to what, what people want and then see how we might be able to assist them in their uh, you know, in their endeavors, but listening to me is just number one, you know, doing that initial assessment and just listening to people, respecting their viewpoint, even though it might be different from our viewpoint, but at least uh, acknowledging that, okay, we acknowledge what you're saying, we have to try to understand what, what, what you're saying to us, so. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Teresa, and you know, and if I could also add on to that, being humble and knowing you don't know everything. You know, uh, you know, we all have different experiences and, and people may know more. I, I just think of uh, my days as a visit, a young visiting nurse thinking I was going to save the world. I, that was corrected probably, you know, I started Monday, but Tuesday afternoon that I was straightened out on that one. So, rec you know, recognizing where people live and, and you know, what is, what is it that they want? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I think we have one room time for maybe one more question from the live audience. Does anybody have anything they want to throw out there or comment on? I yeah. have a go, ahead, go ahead, Zuli. Um, I'm Zuleen Mayfield, the chairperson of Chester Residents Concern for Quality Living in Chester, PA. Mm -hmm. We're an organization that's been around since 1992, dealing with the issues of environmental racism. And apparently now everybody has a environmental justice forum. But what are you all really doing? What, you know, uh, the polluters have co-opted that uh, messaging. Academia yeah. has co-opted that messaging. And you have a lot of um, fraudsters that now want to be on an environmental justice bandwagon. Um, I heard a gentleman say one time, um, not that long ago, and, and it's, it's a thought that is forever present in my mind in terms of Chester. And he, he posed a question to Delaware County Council. And the question was, you all have to decide whether or not Chester is your neighbor or we are your dumping ground. Mm -hmm. We fought this thing for a long time. It's time for Delaware counties, counties to get off of their behind and support us. That incinerator does not have to be in Chester. It does not have to operate. We don't need it. We don't need it. The county, Delaware County Solid Waste Authority, they are moving towards weaning themselves off of the trash. But that is only possible if you all put it forth in Delaware County Council and support their efforts and get it done as soon as possible. 
as soon as possible because what you allow to happen in Chester, you allow to happen to yourself. Mm -hmm. There's no disconnect. Chester, it, I always get angry when I see Delaware County and then there's Chester VA. Segregate it out. Mm -hmm. It's another form of racism, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We are your neighbors. We should not have to bear this fight alone. And we are fighting. You can believe you, me. We are pushing back. So we are asking you all to join us. We have bi-weekly Zoom meetings. We have hybrid meetings. We have a plan of action. And we are working our plan to get these hazards out of our community and stop this environmental genocide because that's what it is. We see our neighbors, our relatives, mothers and fathers dying. Mm -hmm. This is a real thing. It's real. We have four active train lines that ride through Chester. They blow up in Chester. So, I mean, don't think that we're that far away from Ohio. And it can happen. We have the same train line run by the same operators carrying a lot of the same uh, uh, components in those tankers. And we have to be aware. If there ever was a community that was ill-equipped for any tragedy or disaster, Chester is it. There's no way to evacuate. There's no mechanism to do it. I don't even think Delaware County has a true emergency management plan. How do you move people if there's a disaster? That incinerator can catch on fire. The one in Dora Flat in Florida mm -hmm. fall on fire and they couldn't put it out. And who responded? All of in, in Chester's case, who would respond? All of our neighbors who are volunteers, the husbands and sons and daughters of some people on these calls. So we're gonna ask you all to join us. You can go to Chester EJ, I mean, Chester PA EJ. Mm -hmm. Let me put it in here because I'm getting ready to mess it up. Okay. Our information is in there. We mm -hmm. are available. Collectively, we need to put pressure on Delaware County Council. Collectively, we have senators and representatives and Congress people. We can exert our pressure. You did it in Marple to get Don Guanella determined to be a part. Mm -hmm. It was no issue of finances. They did it just like that. Irritated me to no end. Why? Because it was done for the health, safety, and the environment of the people in Marple. No question, 300 something million dollars. Everybody knows the financial situations of Chester. We should not be prostituted for pollution because of our economic status. And that takes all of Delaware County to help. So um, we are available. We applaud you all for even tackling this issue. Um, it should be an ongoing conversation. Ongoing because we are all neighbors. And what happens in Chester happens also to you all. We may get it sooner, but you definitely breathe in everything that we get. You may not get the hazards of the trucks and the nonsense of the noise and smell, but you are breathing everything we ingest. So join us. Um, that's our play. And thank you. Zuline, thank you. We could not have had a more appropriate statement to close out this program. That was tremendous. Thank you. And the information is is in the chat here for people to um, contact them and participate. Oh, I forgot to mention April 22nd, we're having a march. It's right it's here. It's in environmental the Justice March. Yep. Please join us, please. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. And all thank right. all of you for coming. Thank you, Ruth, for pulling this together for us. Yeah. Yay. And thank you, Zeline, for the final word. Thank you. That was tremendous. And I guess that's that's a wrap. Check out the website for our future programs and we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.